Oh, this is exciting. This has been like, in my mind, years in the making. I was like, I know one day I'm going to talk about this, but I just don't know when. <laughs> Hi, guys, and welcome to a very special, very exciting episode of Tea Talk. So I am here today with my great cousin. That's the title, right? You would be my great cousin. Sounds good. I think that's I think that's the title. My great cousin, <laughs> Miss Mary Owen, who is also the daughter of Donna Reed. Um, now this is something that I haven't talked about too much on my channel, but if you've been following closely for the last 12 years, which I literally can't believe I've been making videos for 12 years now, wild. Um, you've heard me mention it before that I am related to Donna Reed. And so this is, this is the relation. Donna is actually my great aunt. So my dad's dad was Donna's brother or her or Mary's mom's oh. brother. <laughs> I always have a hard time explaining family relations. Hopefully that all made it's sense. Like I know it's like you need a flow chart, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a little confusing about <laughs> faces, but hopefully you get it. So I'm very excited to be talking to Mary today. And um, this is just, this has been years in the making. I was just saying that to Mary, like I always knew we were going to have this heart to heart conversation about our family and to be able to just share this with you guys is really special. And I've really realized in recent years, um, and part of that honestly was was going to that theater to see It's a Wonderful Life with you in Nashville. I really realized how much not only It's a Wonderful Life has meant to people, like how much it's really touched people's lives, um, but also how much Donna meant to people. And so this is a conversation I'm excited to have. We're going to talk about personal stuff, personal life. We're going to talk about It's a Wonderful Life because this is actually the 75th anniversary of the movie, which how is that possible? Where does time go? It's, I don't know. it's wild. So I'm yeah. really excited. So everybody round of applause for Miss Mary Owen. <laughs> well, I'm excited to be here because I, I really have, um, you know, enjoyed your progression and, um, the things that you talk about and that were related and you know I love your dad and mm. I loved uh, your grandpa my uncle Keith and yeah yeah I was just telling Mary I watched a video this morning that's on YouTube that somehow I had managed to to miss I hadn't seen it um but it's called is it called this is our life or this is your life that's what this it's is called. your life this yeah. is your life and it's it's a show i guess that existed in like the 60s yeah. that they would kind of bring family members of different celebrities onto the show and or people that impacted them in their life and um i had i haven't i mean obviously i haven't seen my grandpa since he passed away when i was in like fourth grade i was very young um and i'd never seen my my great grandpa and it it surprised me. It made me very emotional to see, wow, like family, like he had my grandpa, which had my dad, which had me. And now I have my son and just that bloodline. Yeah. It's just it's wild to see family. So I'm very excited to be talking to you. Um, so I guess we'll just open it up. I kind of want to talk about kind of personal stuff. <laughs> what was it like? This is a corny first question, but we're just going to lay it out corny. What was it like to have Donna Reed or Donna Bell Mullinger <laughs> as a mother? Oh, well, I don't, you know, it's a, it's an interesting question because in a way, I don't know that there's anything like it, <laughs> mm. you know, to have um, a celebrity for a mom. Mm. And then of course my dad was in the business too. He was a producer and a really big behind the scenes guy. So to grow up with two parents, both parents in the business was difficult. I'll be honest. Mm, yeah. um, my mom was a working mom back in the day when that was not ordinary like it is now. Yeah. And so in a lot of ways, she was quite ahead of her time. Yeah. But by the time I was born, um, her film career was over and her television show was about a year and a half uh, from starting. Wow. So each that show was ran for eight years, 275 episodes. And if you do the math, it's about 39 episodes per season. So wow. they worked from September to May. And, um, you know, she was gone, uh, you know, at six in the morning and oftentimes not back till 
after dinner. And, you know, I had a nanny I didn't really care for too much. She was, (laughs) I mean, from my mother's perspective, she was definitely a good nanny. But from my perspective, you know, I was just, you know, watched too carefully and she wasn't my mom. So she was, she was watching you. You mean like she was very tough love type of thing and she wasn't your mom. Yes. And she wasn't my mom. I think that was just more to the point. And she was older. So Mm. she was not a young mom. You know what I mean? Like she was more a disciplinarian. You mean, Um, you mean Donna was? was. No, the nanny. The the nanny was. Gotcha. Okay. The Yeah. 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 Um, Although since we're talking about age, my mother was also ahead of her time because she had me when she was 36 which, wow. you know, in 1957, that was, that was pretty, later. That was out there. Yeah. 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 She really wanted another kid because my siblings are much older and they're almost, I think when I was growing up, they were almost like aunts and uncles. Um, wow. I don't know because I don't, I don't know your siblings. So I don't know that I realized how many siblings do you have? So there's four of us. Okay. Uh, so my sister Penny is the oldest and she's uh, 12 years older than I am. And then Tony is 11 years older. And then Tim is eight years older. Wow. And your dad's name is Tony too, right? Yes. 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 So you, so you were born right before she started the Donna Reed show, which your dad, which your dad produced, right? Yeah. So what happened was after she won the Oscar in 1954 and from here to eternity, You'd think her career would just skyrocket, but she ended up in a lot of B Westerns. Mm. And not only, you know, some of them are good. I happen to like Westerns because I love horses, (laughs) but you know, they're all kind of, you know, they're B movies and she she didn't enjoy it at all. So they started their own production company, kind of like Lucy and Desi had done previously And they made a couple of movies together and then decided maybe to try television, which, you know, was still relatively new. Mm. And they had different ideas, like maybe she'd be a spy for the FBI Mm. or she'd be, I think one of the ideas would she was be an elevator operator in the Chrysler building. So each week, each floor would be, you know, the storyline, what was going on on that floor. But Oh, that's um, funny. Yeah, that would be strange, right? Yeah, yeah. Those are both very interesting ideas. But then she had been in Iowa for, uh, there was a beautiful promo photograph of her sitting on a wall with Karen holding a goat and then Mm. uh, Tony, Penny and Tim who are all kind of close in age. And it's beautiful, it's color and she looks, it's really iconic. (laughs) And someone, and my dad had that on his desk and someone said, well, why doesn't she play a wife and mother? And my dad agreed because he, you know, he knew she was also so good at that. And so that's how they started the show. My dad got all the money together. I mean, he was really the principal wow. architect of the show. And that's one of the reasons wow. why it's so good is because it was their show. Yeah, they really, it wasn't like executives running everything. They were the ones really hands in putting it together. Making all the decisions and mm-hmm. hiring and firing. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Isn't that interesting that they were toying around with these ideas that were more like outlandish and yeah. kind of wild. And yeah. then they settle on, you know, what they, what they know and what so many people relate to and know, and that's what sticks. Yeah. Well, it, it is interesting because it's right. Like it'd be sort of a conservative format, but I think mm. what makes the show interesting is that it's really mother knows best mm. and it's, it's got my mother's name on it and yeah. she is always involved in making the decisions and, and there's humor too. I mean, she has a sense of humor about herself too. Yeah, yeah. And um so even though it's from mother's perspective, she's very involved. So it's, it's not wishy-washy, you know? Yeah. Which it could have been. Oh, exactly. I think something that really strikes me when I watch the show is how good of an actress she is. Like, it's really yeah. phenomenal to see, 
you know, because the writing has changed so much on television and in movies. So, you know, and obviously the camera work, but there's nothing about her performance that is um, like corny or cringe. It's yeah. very nuanced. It's very layered. Like she sh she does so much with her face without being over the top. It's really phenomenal. I'm actually getting chills thinking of it because I didn't really know that until recent years. Oh well, yeah, my aunt was Donna Reed and she was in It's a Wonderful Life. And I really feel like it's in these last three to five years where I've watched more of the show. And then obviously, like I said, going to the theater in Tennessee, I'm like, oh my gosh, like she was really talented. And the depth in her performance, like we said, it could have been kind of shallow or I don't know. Yeah. Shallow is a good word. And instead it, she's, yeah. she comes across very deep and layered. Yeah. And that there's so much good chemistry between the family, you know, her husband and yes. the kids. Yeah. And I think that accounts for a lot too. And also just it's tight. You know, the writing's really good. I think yes. um, a lot of the episodes, you don't necessarily predict how it's going to end. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, she took her role of speaking to the American family very mm. seriously. I mean, if there was a choice to go funny or s dramatic, she typically tr did not cho choose the, you know, the funny. Mm. She typically choose to, chose to go um, dramatic. So I think that also makes, makes the show. I mean, I love the show. I, you know, watch it every now and then. And I just, I just think it holds up really well. <laughs> it really does. So, I mean, side note, that's not a side note, kind of looping back to the beginning. What a trip, I, I guess that must've been to, like you said, you know, have a nanny, not necessarily be raised full time by Donna and then to see the show, um, that's her whole, like, that's the whole thing, right? Is her being a, a mom. Um, did yeah. you spend, I mean, how trippy was that? Did you spend a lot of time on the set? Like, what, what was that like? I don't know. That's a vague question. I'm just thinking about what a trip that must have been. Yeah. So, I mean, so part of the problem with it was um, our lack of privacy as a family. Mm. Uh, even though, you know, my father loved the business. Like I said, he was the behind the scenes guy and he, he it was 24 seven for him. My mother, when she came home, you know, she really tried to close the door and be a mom. Mm. Now, when, when you have your own television show, that's, you know, I think the wheels were still always turning with her because, you know, she had to memorize lines and yeah, it's a lot a whole cast and crew to be responsible for. Wow. But when she would, you know, we'd go to the grocery store, or try and do something normal, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> then she'd be asked for autographs and, and such. And she was always so gracious about that. Yeah. But um, as a kid, you know, it was infuriating. I just, I, I didn't, I didn't want to share her. And that's kind of what it felt like. Oh uh, yeah. You wanted to just be able to go to the grocery store and be exactly normal, quote unquote, for lack of a better yeah. phrase. Yeah. Just, and, and so that part was uh, difficult. And I, and I know that she knew that was difficult, but I mean, what could you do yeah. about yeah. it? You, you have to be gracious to fans. And, and of course she always was. And, um, but you know, we, she, and she was also, uh, I think this is important to know about my mother, that she was a very private person, you know, even though she was so, so successful. And, you know, once you're on the small screen, you know, you're kind of everywhere. Yeah, she uh, she didn't really ever. I don't think she ever went on a talk show. I don't think she believed in that. Interesting. And she just really tried to keep. Yeah, I I don't re oh. I don't um I don't remember talking to her about it because still I was pretty little, but I know that she um I think she did not believe in those and that she really just respected her need to be private. That's very interesting. So she just really loved the the art of creating a story and, and delivering that. Yeah. Huh. And, and I really think that just made me think that she was really playing grandma in a lot of ways because mm. my mother never had the kind of life that she depicted on the show. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. So like, pl like playing, playing pretend, making this world that she wanted to make. Yeah. Wow. 
So you were one and a half ish when the Donna Reed show came out Mm -hmm. and it ran how long again? Eight years, 1958 to 1966. So do you have any memories? Were you ever on the set hanging out or was it mostly? Yeah, you were. So you do remember it. I do. I mean, truth. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Boring, you know, take after take after Mm -hmm. take, but her um her hairstylist Trudy she had a big gla- um cat you know glasses and of big course hair. she did and I had she was so much fun to hang out with right oh. so she was such a sweetheart and her makeup artist uh, Clay Campbell who she had she had all these people the crew most of the crew for all eight years because she was so wonderful to work with but wow. um, I remember just hanging out with the a lot because you know as also as like a two or a four-year-old like watching them film was just not that exciting but everyone was so sweet with me you know yeah yeah. yes I mean film is it's slower it's slower paced anyways I remember growing up always loved I mean I loved the arts from when I was very little but I preferred theater over camera work because camera felt like a whole lot of hurry up and wait like okay yeah. well, you just wait right there it's like how long do I have to wait here and how many times are we going to do this like yeah right. it's it's a real dedication and I can only imagine since they were running the show there's probably another level of like I don't want to say perfectionism but they know what oh. they're going they knew what they were going for oh yeah well no you can say perfectionism because mm. the one thing we did do as a family every week was watch the show together oh and- <clears throat> on Thursday nights <laughs> it was sweet except yeah. my mother was a perfectionist I mean of uh, course she was because that was her show yes yeah she would see the, all the flaws ah uh, you know and so <laughs> that was painful <laughs> but, so she's like she's like picking it apart like yes. oh that's not the take I wanted oh that angle yeah, yeah. Oh, or that's... like I the line should have been you know so um that's but, so funny yeah yeah I mean I'm sure we would be the same way Oh, I mean, totally. And unfortunately, I mean, this is my opinion. It doesn't mean it's true. But for me personally, sometimes I feel like no matter how many times you try to do something and make it just right, it's like, it's never quite, quite what you wanted because your vision always, like you're always going further and then your talent catches up and it's like, you're always reaching. Man. So do you ever, do you remember now looking back as an adult, do you ever see episodes and you're like, Oh, I remember being there for that. Or like, I remember a funny moment that happened on that episode or is it too far? I mean, you were pretty young. That's young memories before the age of 10 is, I can hardly remember memories before the age of 10, (laughs) but I don't know because you were filming so much. I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't actually, I do remember Leslie Gore was in the very last episode singing you know it's my party yes and I remember that I remember she was so lovely and she had a beehive hairdo oh and you know and I just remember you know kind of crushing out on her I just thought she was the best and she couldn't have been sweeter with me you know wow that's (laughs) that's so funny so you you have a brother that's around your age right (laughs) uh tim is eight years older oh tim is eight years older you said it for some reason i thought he was closer to your age Mm -hmm. so he was in the house too when all of this was going on (sighs) yes tim was but he was older so he would have been a teenager and i don't remember him being on the set he was probably you know like in high school and doing his own thing um I know it's, it's, I know this is going to sound weird, but I almost feel like in a, in a certain way, like an only child Hmm. because they were so much older. And so I don't remember them being as involved. Although my other brother, Tony, so my father at one point asked all of us if we wanted to be on the show. I'm sure I was probably too young, but Tony said yes. And he's in a couple of episodes towards the end of the later seasons. Yeah. Wow. What an experience. Yeah. Yeah, I think he really enjoyed it. So, so I don't remember my siblings being on the set and I, um, so much. Yeah. Interesting. The Donna Reed show eight years, they came up with that concept together in a lot of ways. It was like Donna 
creating a, I mean, not necessarily a childhood, maybe more of like a motherhood that she didn't get to live, but that she felt like was beautiful and ideal. Yeah. And yeah. you got to watch that on the screen. And now you get to look back as an adult and see that. Um, and I just, I just keep thinking what a trip that is to not actually live that life, but to see it played out and then to go to a grocery store as a kid. And it's like, this is my mom and be doing the autographs and right. just, just what a, a whirlwind that was. And you said she had already won her Academy award or from here to attorney. So she was very well known by this point. Yes. Well, yeah. I mean, in those days though, you know, there wasn't VHS and that kind of thing. So if you didn't see the movie in the theater, you probably didn't see the movie. I mean, that I never occurred it. to me. That totally makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Because I didn't see It's a Wonderful Life until I was in college and it was playing at a local theater in LA. And my best friend said, you know, you have to see this movie. Your mother said it. And I was like, I don't know anything about her film acting. Wow. I just know her, her job is to go to the studio every day and do the show. So that was also a huge revelation because she's 25 years old in the movie I'd never seen her that young and wow I got it that she was so talented right that she, you know she's like mesmerizing in that movie and she, yes I had no idea so, so anyway I know this is yeah no it's not it's it's amazing this is this is what I want so when you say you were in college when you saw It's a Wonderful Life and you're like, oh, all I knew is that she's going to the studio. Are you talking about in your past or are you saying that because she was doing Dallas at the time, so she was still working? No, that was that was before Dallas. It was just um, my- uh, That's just your well, vision the, of her. Yeah. Well, at the time when I was in college, she was doing probably like, uh, maybe she wasn't working, but I was out of the house. You know, I was in college and my memories were just of her as, you know, from the show. And since there wasn't VHS or really any way, and they didn't really show old movies on television too much either. Yeah. So the opportunity to be well-versed in film would be difficult unless you actually went to the theater to see the movies when they came out. Yeah, that is such, so, you yeah. saying that, I'm like, oh my gosh, that totally makes sense. And that's kind of a segue, not that I'm trying to necessarily leap there yet, but we can. That makes me think about how I had heard that the reason why It's a Wonderful Life really started picking up traction was because like 30 years later, it became like syndicated and was put on television. So television served it to the masses every year in like starting in like the 70s or something like that. Is that true? Am I making that up? No, it's it's mostly true. What happened was the um, somebody uh, forgot to renew the copyright, so it fell into the public domain. That's right. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And that's what brought it back to life and, and made it get rediscovered, uh, the small screen. So yeah, it was the late 70s, early 80s that it was on all the time. I mean, you couldn't even flip through at Christmas time any channel without seeing it on. Um, what a it was beautiful. kind of like annoying. Yeah. <laughs> what a beautiful, wild stroke of good luck and bad luck, depending on who you're talking to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just completely random, you know, just one clerical error. Uh, and that's, you know, this is what we've got now, 75 years of a movie that just continues to grow in popularity. I was just going to say, it's amazing because it's an error and a mistake, but also if you, you know, want to see things through the lens of, of positivity and nothing being a mistake or whatever. It's like, that's really beautiful. That's what allowed it to get yeah. this cultural, I don't know, momentum and really speak to people. It's a message that is so important. I mean, I, I was watching some guy review the movie the other day from like last year. I had no idea. I mean, I started to realize this, like I said, in Tennessee, when I came to the theater but people, I mean, that movie has impacted people so deeply and people are still watching and reviewing it and talking about just what a stellar film it is and how touching it is. So it's, that's really amazing. Just a clerical error gone horribly wrong slash right. 
Yeah. 75 yeah, I years. I know. I mean, there's so few movies. I mean, it's, it's interesting when you think about like, I'll watch a movie two or three times, but usually the second or third time it's like, okay, well, you know, it was really good the first time, Uh huh. but it's a wonderful life just gets more. I mean, you always see something different. I do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, I don't know how many times I've seen it many, many times, but it never gets old. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think, I think part of <clears throat> why it never gets old, which is kind of what you and I were talking about before, just what's even going on culturally right now is that I think that most people can relate to that feeling of, of why am I here? Like, what's, what's the point? Do I bring anything to the table with my relationships? Would it even matter if I was gone? Like, that's such a, I think such a universal feeling for people at different stages in their life. Um, and I think that that's a big part of what makes it timeless is that conversation in general. Yeah. Right. Because it is, I mean, when you think about it, it's a very depressing movie. Yeah. And uh -huh. it's pretty dark and, um, um, right. And what, you know, what, what brings value, you know, to your life. Yes. And how, and how all people are kind of interconnected. We all really yeah. need each other. You know, yes. that's something yeah. that, I read that article that you sent over from the woman. I don't know if that's bad for me to mention it. I mean, no. you sent it to me, the Mary problem yeah. and her and her talking about, and I can, okay. So here's, here's the thing. I'm a little bit of a child of, I'm like a postmodernist. I hate to admit it. If that's how we're going to word, I'm a little bit of a relativist. So I can kind yeah. of like see things in lots of different ways. I can kind of see what she's saying. Basically, Mary sent me an article saying it was called the Mary problem and basically the woman says that her problem, and you tell me if I'm encapsulating this wrong, it's been a crazy week. My sister's getting married this week. I'm a little all over the place, but basically <laughs> the gist of what she said is that at the end of the movie, uh, when Jimmy Stewart sees that, you know, okay, I keep calling them by their real names, but Donna is like living as a librarian basically, and, and didn't ever get married because he didn't exist. And they're saying that's, that's not what would have happened. Like she would have married the other guy in town. She would have had a nice life. It's insulting to insinuate that because she didn't marry him, her life fell apart. And I read that and I thought, okay, I, I can kind of, if I, I can kind of see what you're saying, but I also thought, I mean, how do you know what their love was and how people interact with each other? Like in theory, sure. If I had never married Dan, I would have married someone else. In theory, I would have been fine. But on some other, I mean, if it's all theory anyways, on some other level, yeah. Dan has made me so much of, of who I am. And we're so interconnected and we we need each other. Like we love each other. We don't need each other, but we need each other. Like yeah. we're all so connected. And I think that that's kind of the way that I took it. Like they are so, and they were connected from childhood. That was a ramble, but, but I just, I think, um, well, I think what the, also what she was trying to say, because I, I think, you know, it's fun to kind of say that it's a wonderful life is nearly a flawless movie. I mean, they're just, you know, there's so many great character actors and faces and, yeah. you know, it's not like a Hollywood glamorous, you know, kind of thing. And, and, um, and, the, and I think for, for a lot of people, the one flaw is that, that uh, Mary Hatch would have been a librarian, not that there's anything wrong with that, but I think that her depiction when she comes out is that she's kind of mousy and, you know, yes. a spinster. Yes. And I think what was interesting about that article was that not that, I don't know that she would have married Sam Wainwright because, you know, in that very first scene, she tells George, you know, I'm going to love you till the day that I die. And yeah. kind of the article is that she chose him and the fact that he didn't exist, there was nobody like George for her to marry, you know, that she yeah. would be interested in yeah. if she chose to not be married. Yeah. And that to me was like so fantastic because huh. it, I, I do think the way she's depicted there and that just briefly, it is a negative, mm. but I thought the article made it sound like, well, this was her choice. And she chose from the very beginning, all throughout her life, she wanted. When I first saw the movie, well, first of all, it's interesting that you say you're post a postmodernist because I'm 
more that way too and not generally a nostalgic person mm. and so I always have a little bit of an attitude when I sit down to watch It's a Wonderful Life but it always just slays me it's such a good movie I know right I have to say um, I'm, I'm regrettingly a like I, I don't like that I'm a postmodernist. I don't think it's good <laughs> for everything to be relative but I just notice in my reactions and engagement with the world, I'm like, oh man, I tend to be more like relativist in a lot of yeah. ways. Anyways, yeah. go on. So it slays yeah. you when you watch it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I try to, uh, you know, think that uh, it's not going to get to me or, or something, you know, that I've just seen it so many times, but when I first saw it and what really still strikes me, especially, you know, the, what builds up to the end where this community comes together mm. and takes care of people. And I think, you know, that was kind of more going on like in the sixties and the early seventies, it didn't matter who you were or whatever, that there was this feeling that you would be helped by the community. And yeah. I feel like we've kind of lost that. You know? Oh my gosh, definitely. I, yeah. I mean, that's going to be hard for me to not go off on a whole separate rant. I will say, <laughs> I will say, getting away from larger cities and honing in on things that are really important to me, like things that I'm very passionate about, um, has allowed me to see that that still exists, but it's like, it's not necessarily in the larger cities, in my opinion, that's not what I saw. I found that it was harder in like big areas with, you know, six, 7 million people, um, it's just life was different back then. I think, you know, the population was smaller. I think people were uh, maybe, what would be the word? They were united on mm -hmm. some more similar values. And and now, and part of that, I think, is the whole postmodernist thing, right? It's like, there's so much relativism. But I think that that really does represent something that a lot of people are craving, and I think yes. that it can hopefully be found again. I'm starting to see it more. Um, like I said, in my life is like my values become more honed in and even living in a smaller town. And it's, but it's kind of a trip coming from a big city where you're like, oh, is this real? Like, are you really that supportive? Um, because you get a little bit like questioning when you're like raised in a big city, like, what do you want? <laughs> are you just going to disappear? Like what's happening? Uh, but that movie encapsulates that and that's yet another thing I think that a lot of people are missing and craving and I think that's probably how community should be you know yeah and that and that is part of you know why it's almost like a I think you know what my audiences now when I introduce the movie in New York are mostly in their 20s and early 30s oh, isn't that interesting so they, yeah and they you know, they've had this tradition of watching it with their family and they're keeping the tradition. And mm. I just feel like it's, it's just a whole experience. It's almost, you know, it's, it's at the end of the year when you tend to be reflective anyway, Yes, thinking about the past year and looking ahead to the new year. And I think that movie just really is a great ritual too, to kind of get you thinking about that and also feeling like yeah you know I I wish there was more of a I was part of something that was bigger yes uh-huh yeah that that community aspect can give you that feeling that bigger feeling of taking care of more than just yourself yeah. and they really represent that when everybody comes together to care for him so you, so, okay. You saw the movie for the first time when you were in college at a local theater in LA. Uh, the new and, art. Yeah. And were you just, did you just walk out? Were you like, what? This is a totally different side of my mom or like just mind blown. I was mind blown. I was pretty mind blown. I mean, especially that first scene on the dance floor, like you were talking earlier about even in the show, like how good she is with her eyes and yes. the, even not using words. Uh-huh. And um I just, you know, and I use the word a lot that luminous. She's she's mm. luminous in that. And 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 then she was just so good throughout the whole movie. And it, it was, I mean, of course, Mary Bailey isn't that far from let's say Donna Stone. Yeah. And and also I think, you know, because Frank Capra wanted like 
Gene Arthur and then Ginger Rogers to play Mary Bailey and thank God they weren't available. But I mean, growing up in, in Crawford County in rural Iowa, you know, her values were to play Mary Bailey were, you know, already there. Yes. Yes. That was already and, a part of who she was. Yeah. So it wasn't, it wasn't like she was strange to me. She was familiar, but she was, it was just a whole other thing that I'd never seen before and experienced. Yeah. Yeah, what a, I mean, that's a trip side note in general, like, don't go on a tangent, Nikki, but people being born, right? Like having my son and looking at him and being like, I lived this whole other life before you even got here. And you'll never know. I mean, he'll know from an observational place, kind of like you do with your mom, like looking back and seeing that movie, like, wow, she did that before I was even a thought, like she lived this whole other life. And that's just got to be so weird because not only is it, I just think weird in general, like I said, like looking at my son, like you'll never know this whole other life I lived before you got here, but she did this thing that's made such a cultural impact and is like, like I said, like we were saying, the storyline is so relevant. And I think even almost more so today because of what we were saying in regards to people not really feeling a lot of people not really feeling like they have a tight-knit community um and then also like we said this whole idea that I think most people have probably battled with um of wondering if their life even matters and if there's even really a reason for them to to be here like do they matter are they part of the community do they bring anything um so yeah that's just got to be such a trip to see that and it's like wow that was way before I was even a thing yeah and not yeah. seeing it until college yeah yeah and just and just you know how strong Mary Bailey is too like she just she never wavered yes and, you know she's always kind of saving George you know she's got the uh, honeymoon money to you know save the run on the bank uh -huh. and you know just all the disappointments in his life and yeah. um, um but and I think that that was that was beautiful like I don't know if I was reading it incorrectly so once again you tell me but in that article I almost felt like that was being painted not as a negative but like you know she was so strong don't you see that and I thought, well, yeah, I mean, in, in my mind, I think that's what can be so beautiful in marriage and a relationship. Oh, a car alarm is going off and it's off. Like, I don't think of a traditional woman, if that's how we want to use it as like a doormat, like just rolling right. over. It's like, it's, it's right. a partnership. I think that my husband needs me, you know, and I need my husband and it's yeah. not like, oh, he's just he's taken care of everything and I'm just, uh, what, or, or vice versa. It's bad. If I'm like spearheading, we're a, we're a partnership. And so I feel like I always saw Mary's strength as a good thing. And as like part of the partnership and part of why they worked so well together, um, was her strength that she brought to that relationship. Yeah, I, I agree. Definitely. I, it is interesting over, um, period of time because I think for a long time you know it was like the movie stars Jimmy Stewart and you know Mary Bailey is just you know of her time and you know it's too bad she wasn't I, I don't know more modern or something and now yeah. she's a lot of people are asking me you know questions about her role and things like that and how you know some people think she's the protagonist of the movie um, ah. so so I, I love it. I mean, that just goes to show how much universality is in the film yes. and that it's just not, it could be, it lend itself to so many different interpretations. And that makes it feel like a piece of literature. You know, it's just so, it has so much going on and there's so much depth there. And Yes. And people can take so many different things from that, that one story, Yeah, which you can't say of all films. So that's yeah. really, that's amazing. So 75 years. Wow. So yeah, I, go on. Uh, I don't know if you know, and you probably don't want to add this, but it's been a real problem for me um, because it's the 75th anniversary. I don't know if you know who Fathom events are. I heard about this from you that they're like not letting oh. smaller theaters play. So the film. I found. I saw someone sent me an article about a small theater in Plymouth, Michigan, 
population, like, I don't know, not that many, 8,000. And um, they have been going to that movie at Christmas since, you know, like 2004. So they protested. There were a thousand people in the street with a sign saying, we are Bedford Falls. Oh. What would Jimmy Stewart say? It was the so fantastic. So wow. I reached out to them and found out about this situation. And I, I said, look, I don't support this at all. I mean, this is a destination seasonal film. Yes. It's just, there's been all this momentum that people now show it in local small theaters. So yeah. Fathom eventually caved and made some exceptions. Oh, um, I don't, I don't know that yeah. I knew that that was the end of that, that they, that they gave in and they said, okay, fine. They did. It's, it's, there are some like when I was in Seneca Falls for the It's a Wonderful Life Festival, there were a couple of people who came up to me and said, you know, we have this organization and we were told we couldn't show the film this year. But I would say in general, a lot of small theaters around the country have been able, but they do take 75% of the ticket sales. Oof. So to like me, that, this is Adam. like straight out of Potter. You know, this is like <laughs> that's exactly it. Yeah, that's really uh, sad, unfortunate. And part of the reason why it's unfortunate is it's not that surprising. That's yeah. what's actually sad about that. It and in is. like direct opposition, like you said, to the whole movie's <laughs> message. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, the <laughs> essence of the film. This is hello. <laughs> 75%. Well, yeah, I mean, my only positive spin that I can really put on it is if it gets a number of people to go see it in the theater, then I don't know if I could say it's worth it, but because yeah. that's my big thing is that it really needs to be seen on the big screen. But yeah, thanks for nothing. I mean, I, I just feel like, wow, how dare they? Yeah, no kidding. Like I said, unfortunately, that's not super surprising, but you're right about seeing it on the big screen it's totally different I never exactly. had until yeah. Tennessee yeah. I was yeah. like, wow this is a totally different experience and because the movie is so old it's not like seeing you know a movie that just came out people like know all the lines my yeah. husband and I just kept like like elbowing each other and giggling because people all around us we're like shouting lines or whispering lines to each other we're like oh my goodness like you you guys all know this movie it's really beautiful. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. Yeah, it it really means a lot to a lot of people. And I, I hear a lot of stories like that, you know, like, oh, I used to watch this every year with my dad and he died. And, you know, I have to, mm. you know, I, I just miss him so much. And, you know, it's not just like a frivolous movie. It's not, it's a big deal to a lot of people. Well, I don't know if you want to go there, but uh, part of what I talk about when I introduce <clears throat> the movie, and I, I probably did it in Nashville, is um, the effects of World War II on the film. Yeah. And then I, I read a few of the letters from the soldiers. Oh, I would love but, that. Know. If you're, okay. if you're, if you are feeling that, I know that you've been doing a lot of these presentations. Oh, yeah, okay. So if you're over it, that's fine. But if you want to, I think that'd no, be amazing. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah. Okay. This movie was it just so many things went into it to make it you know what it is that mm. people weren't aware of at the time but um, this was the first movie that Frank Capra and Jimmy Stewart did after World War II oh wow. so they had all this incredible success prior to the war you know Mr. Smith goes to Washington and and then Jimmy Stewart won um, the best actor award in 1940 for the Philadelphia story so he was essentially on the top of his game Wow. And then enlisted in the Air Force and was gone for five years. That's um, right. And he came back a um, highly decorated bomber pilot. Wow. Possibly with a little PTSD because he didn't, he wanted to give up acting. Wow. He thought it was too frivolous. Um, I could but see Lionel that. Barry, yeah, right. After all those experiences, yeah. seeing all that action. Yeah. Yeah, I could see that. But he changed his mind and um, Frank Capra. Wait, you made a was, comment. You said Lionel, you said Lionel Barrymore and then I oh, interrupted you. So like, yeah. So Lionel Barrymore and he were friends. And I think mm. he, he discussed this idea of quitting acting with uh, Mr. Barrymore. And he said, please don't, you know, you can still reach people and you have a lot to give as an actor. So please don't quit. So, wow. That worked. Yeah. yeah, I know, right? 
and um and then capra of course was too old to enlist although if he had been younger he would have and so he hmm. um worked for the army corps making the why we fight series which is an incredible i think it's maybe 10 or 12 hours it might even be on amazon documentary uh talking about why we're involved in world war ii and a lot wow. of it i haven't seen all of it but some of it is incredible the way he just talks about freedom of religion and you know he goes kind of against the whole anti you know fascist thing but in such a brilliant way so he was gone from hollywood too hmm. and also privy to uh, atrocity footage and things of that nature that maybe americans hadn't seen yet or saw much later you said so atrocity came... footage sorry atrocity footage no, no, you're my fine. mouth no, no, you're good. What is atrocity footage? You mean like well, war I would, footage? Yeah, like probably more like concentration camp um, imagery. Gotcha. Okay. I think that took a long time to come to the American, you know, general public because it probably, you know, couldn't believe that that was actually going on. And, yeah. you know, so, but he was there for all wow. of that. So he, he came back. They came back different people, of course. Why wouldn't they? Yeah. Um, and there was a lot of insecurity on the set because maybe they didn't have what it took anymore to make movies. You know, maybe yeah. um, that was true of Capra. Then Jimmy Stewart had this insecurity about acting. And wow. um, so my mother said she thought maybe originally it part had to do with her because she was quite a bit less well-known. She was only 25 when she played Mary Bailey. Wow. And she had been mostly in these MGM kind of ingenue roles. And so Capra really didn't know who she was, but, hmm. but she was recommended and he went to the set, uh, the MGM lot to meet her. And then he knew right away that she'd be perfect as Mary Bailey. So, wow. So anyway, so you're, yeah. I, forgive me if I'm confused or maybe the tense is mixed up. You're saying that she was worried because she, so she was worried to take the role because she hadn't really done projects that big or were you kind of talking about the future because I had heard before and maybe I'm making this up that at first the film wasn't super successful and Jimmy Stewart had like kind of blamed Donna for for that and she, exactly. are you saying that she so were you kind of forwarding a little bit like she kind of took that on or were you saying that when she first took the role she was like, ooh, I'm a little nervous here because. No, she was super excited to take the role. Okay. And, but she said there was some, um, this tension on the set and she wasn't sure it was about. And she thought maybe it had to do with her because she was just not that well known. Interesting. And so she felt no, it while filming. She felt it while filming. In fact, when it came time to do that incredible telephone kissing scene, um, uh -huh. Jimmy Stewart was not comfortable or ready when it was in the schedule. So he asked to put it off. Yeah. And so when he was finally ready to shoot it, they, you know, they set it up and he, he asked my mother if, you know, she wanted to rehearse it. And she said, yeah, let's just, you know, let's just jump in. I'm sure she didn't use those words exactly, but yeah. Um, and they got it on the first take. Wow. Yeah. How amazing is that? I know. So when you think about just the complexity of that final moment, you know, where they end up kissing and everything, there's just so much, so many mixed feelings going on. Wow. And they, you know, they were really inside of him as well. Yeah. Wow. I mean, and that says so much that says so much about their talent, their commitment. It also says something interesting to me about Frank Capra, that he was willing to be like, we got it. And yeah. that was it. Like, because exactly. I don't, I mean, I've never worked with a director who, even if I felt like it was like a good, like, I think we got, like, they want yeah. safety takes, they want extra yeah. takes. They kind of right. want to just keep beating it. And you're like, can we just move? On? So that's very interesting that he also had the awareness and confidence to be like, that was the magic. Yeah. We're moving on. Like, yep. It's yeah, very interesting. That, that's a good point too, because um, my mom said he was the most demanding and satisfying director she'd ever worked with. And they did do a different take, different angle. You know, he was just 
like the, even the the kids going down the stairs there at the end huh um i think they shot that like 25 times you know whoa he was, so that really does say did, something that wow. one take was done yes yes wow. yes he, yes yeah exactly interesting yeah okay so sorry go on yeah so um so my mother also i mean everyone participated in the war effort back in world mm. war ii i mean it affected i mean i even have her ration cards even wow. though she was living in it you know and and um one of her relatives uh i was speaking to and back in denison years ago and they said oh yeah most of what we you know uh grew and created on the farm we had to give to the war effort so yeah wow yeah. that's that's so, different i've heard before that you know a lot of people during world war ii were growing their own food that you know like the victory garden thing was essential yeah. but i've never heard that before that the food that they were growing was going oh, yeah. back to help the war effort that's very interesting yeah definitely so my my mother um you know when she visited grandma and grandpa she did bond drives in denison and she uh huh. the hollywood canteen she danced with soldiers and and had lunch with them and that kind of stuff wow and then then totally unbeknownst to any of us kids she received letters from uh, World War II soldiers. And hmm. I, it, it's strange that she never talked about it. I mean, certainly not with me because I was born later. Mm. But I think the war effort was so all-consuming that I, I believe once it was over, you know, people- It just, was over. Yeah, didn't want to talk about it. Yeah, um, no, that makes sense. But we were, um, after- um, in 2003, we're going through some this, uh, this locked closet, storage closet. And there was a, a trunk, which might have been the trunk that she moved from Iowa to L.A. in. Wow. And there were these shoe boxes full of letters. And at first, they were letters um, from Grandma because, you know, Mom was the first to, to leave. And she was wow. so upset and, you know, nervous. And so they, oh. I think Grandma probably wrote to my mother if not every day, every other day. Oh, that's so <laughs> I know, sweet. I know. But in and amongst those letters were um, like over 300 letters from World War II soldiers. Whoa, 300. Yeah. And wow. I think, you know, like I said, everyone uh, participated in the war effort. Mm. But I think what makes mom special is that she saved the letters. Yeah, that's amazing. Not, you know, not many people do. Not many people do. Wow. So I I have a couple if you <clears throat> would like me to read them just cuz <clears throat> I don't know, I think they're important. I think it also takes one back to those to yes. times. And also, you know, there's just conflict everywhere. Yeah. I mean, uh, and it's Christmas and a lot of times our men and women, you know, in uniform can't be home. Yeah. I was just going to say it's it's really uh it's like a time I don't know, like we're going back in time. So I'm very interested to hear this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, this one is dated May 5th, 1944 from Beachhead, Italy. Wow. Dear, dear Miss Reed, we here on the Beachhead had the opportunity of seeing you in See Here Private Hargrove. And we were delighted with your performance. Cool. We have what we call the Tunnel Club. And we've elected you Miss Tunnel 1944. <sighs> the Tunnel Club is composed of five lonely officers of this ACAC -ac brigade. We sleep in a tunnel under the remains <clears throat> of an Italian villa. Wow. Congratulations on your swell performance. And we're looking forward to seeing you again on the screen. Sincerely, your five tunneliers, Joe, Hank, Big Ugly, George, and Jim. Wow, we sleep in a tunnel. Yeah, under an Italian villa. Wow. Yeah, under the remains. <laughs> yeah, that's right? wild. Yeah. Um, here's another one. I think, you know, I think the studio heads came up with this idea of the pinup culture. And um, huh. when I found the letters, I was kind of in between. I was trying to move to New York and I didn't really get to them um, until <clears throat> around 2007 or eight because I didn't want to move them. I didn't want to ship them. 
and I couldn't fit them in the car. And it mm. wasn't until a couple of years later that I went back to LA that I could hand take them back on the airplane. Mm. So it wasn't until I sat down and decided that I would read them all at once instead of, you know, this letter here, that letter here, that um, I realized um, how important they were and how my mother represented the home front and how important that was because what did yeah. they have besides these pinup girls to remind them of what they were fighting for? Yeah. Uh, I'm not changing the subject. It's just adding on to that. My husband and I lived in Singapore at oh. earlier on in our marriage. Uh, well, I guess that was like 14 years ago. Whoa. That was a minute ago. Um, yeah. But we lived in Singapore and we weren't doing anything scary. We weren't fighting a war. We were just living abroad. And it, but it was scary in the sense that like, you know, culture shock away from our family, you know, we, we had to travel a really long time to get to Singapore and there were times it was, it was almost a little embarrassing, but it is, it is what it is where we would watch television vision shows or movies because it would make us feel connected to home, like seeing oh, the language, yeah. um, hearing the inside jokes. And we weren't, like I said, we weren't doing anything that profound. We were just working abroad. Um, so that makes sense. I can only imagine being disconnected from everyone you love and you're sacrificing and you're fighting like to, to have that um, image, that idea to focus on and remember like why you're there and to be comforted by that memory of like home still exists. Yeah. They're still there living. Yeah. I can imagine that that would mean a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Almost like, um, even they were like talisman or something that they pinned up in their barracks or whatever. So they, they showed What's a, a talisman. Few, it, it's like a, a, a representative, like a symbol, okay. you know, like a representative of what you're, what you're, um, you know, like culturally or what, you know, kind of vibes with you. Huh. Okay. And, and a rep and, you know, it's like a representation, almost kind of like a, like a mythic figure. Okay. Um, and, um, and so they, you know, they had articles, you know, there were magazines with articles about the, you know, celebrities and things like that. My mom was a little bit younger than like the Betty Grables and the Rita Hayworths. So, mm. um, and I think she really reminded guys of like wanting to come home and survive, you know, and marry and raise a family. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 So, wow. Well, here's another one. <clears throat> this one's dated the 15th of July, 1944. Uh, somewhere in the Southwest Pacific. Dear Miss Donna Reed, um, out here we haven't seen a picture with you in it for a long time and decided that something must be done about it. You're acting out here as tops with both of us and you always remind us of our girls we left behind. Mm. For a movie star to portray as big a part as our girls back home, we consider you the best. Well, out here, we don't receive the latest movies, but those that are shown to us are most welcome. Yeah. Our life out here may be rugged, but with you as our movie girlfriend, I imagine we'll survive. Oh. Both of us feel that a picture for each of us would boost our morale 100%. Of course, the more pictures of you, the better. In fact, we would like to complete an album with just your photographs. <laughs> also, if you would like to boost our morale 500%, you could write us a little note. Um, whatever your reactions may be, we want to thank you right now. Uh, sincerely yours, uh, Corporal Bob Galchak and Corporal Bob Herb Bickelhaupt, Beaver, Beaver Dam in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Yeah. Wow. What, yeah. A, what a trip. Time is so weird. Like that was almost a hundred years ago. Yeah, right. Time is so weird. Yeah. Yeah, and a lot of them, these couple that I read were uh, typewritten, but a lot of them, you know, like who even and, writes in cursive anymore? <laughs> right, that's exactly it. And just the sentiment and also just even writing to someone you don't know, you know, but mm. have this kind of fantasy about and I don't know. It, it really had an effect on me reading, reading them all at once because I realized, you know, they weren't just writing to, to a, they weren't just fans. It, it meant more. 
And it yeah, was, when it really, by, sorry, go on. Yeah, it just was, it was an essential part of the war effort. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and by immersing yourself and reading letter after letter after, that's really like immersive to be able to experience, yeah. wow, like they all came at her and it's a lot. And who knows if she even saved them all? That's the thing. It's like 300 is a lot. Yeah. But who knows if there was even more? You yeah, know, there might have been more. There, some of the guys sent pictures. Some of them sent money, like from Algeria. I've got this money from Algeria for postage. Um, yeah. And they're wow. all like this. They're not, you know, cheesy or anything like that. Wow. I mean, she, okay. You tell me if this is an annoying subject change or if this loops back in, but I don't think I'm making this up. I heard that Donna had a pen pal, like for her whole life, basically. She did. She did. And she, did she meet her near, near the end? I feel like I oh, heard they met. God, this is so tragic. So oh, no. they, they, they started, um, well, no, they started, uh, writing when they were 13 and they're all these cool like my mom drew the farm like from above oh it's so incredible like like she was in a drone or something it's and it's really accurate like you know the the house and then the like different parts of the farm and then like the terrain and some of the trees but it was like from above so and then she has all these drawings of fashion like she obviously loved fashion so there's huh. dresses and shirts and things and they talk about that but and one of the most fun letters I don't have it right now she had um she had signed her contract with MGM oh my goodness for eight years and she she writes at the bottom she goes biggest thrill meeting Clark Gable on the MGM lot Mickey Rooney asked me out on a date. I'm too busy. <laughs> Donna Bell's busy. <laughs> she's got stuff she's working on. <laughs> but um, but anyway, um, in some of the letters, especially as mom um, started the show, she went on press junkets to New York and things like that. And she and Violet lived in Pittsburgh. And so she mentions quite a few times I'm looking forward to meeting the gal, you know, that I know so well. And they never met. What? Yeah. They, they never, never met. Yeah. Um, do you know why that is? I don't. I guess maybe Violet just didn't have the kind of life that she could meet mom in New York or mom didn't have the time to stop in Pittsburgh. I'm just not sure, but wow. Yeah, they never but, they, met. but I met I got to meet Violet what you met yeah, her I did she had donated all the letters to the Donna Reed Foundation which you know we can talk about at some point and wow. so she yeah that was about 15 years ago and she she only passed away two years ago so she lived to be 99 wow but after she donated the letters a year or two afterwards, she came out to Denison for the annual festival. Mm -hmm. And so I got, I had dinner with her I, and we stayed in touch and yeah, she was, she was great. She had a bunch of kids and um, she, but she, they never met. Yeah. yeah. Wow. But, but they, they wrote through Donna's entire life. They did. I mean, of course, not as much when they were kids, um, but they did, you yeah. know. I mean, that's pretty phenomenal. And that's got to be very weird as a pen pal to watch your pen pal, like I'm going to Hollywood. <laughs> and then she, you're like, good for you, pen pal. And then they go, like, what do you mean you met Clark Gable? What do you mean you're doing? And then all of a sudden she's Donna Reed. Like that's got to be such a trip. Yeah. That's my phrase today. Such a trip, but you know, a lot of no, things are trippy. <laughs> and also that my mom like continued to write to her, right? Like she didn't, you know, she was Donna Reed. Like maybe she didn't have to. Yeah, she yeah. was pretty busy. <laughs> uh -huh, but she had her. That's, it's funny because I've thought of her a few times because I've had a, a pen pal for like the last six years or so mm -hmm. that I've, I've never met. And I'm like, it's like, I'm channeling my great aunt, me and my yeah. pen pal. <laughs> maybe one day wow. we'll, hopefully we get to meet, but yeah. You know, that's, that's so beautiful that you got to meet her. Yeah. Yeah. I was so happy to meet her and she was, she was fabulous. She was really feisty and um, mm. yeah. And it was fun staying in touch with her. Yeah. And it was great that she donated the letters. I, none of us had any idea. Yeah. 
Oh, you didn't even know till she donated the letters. Mm -mm. No, I didn't know that she had a pen pal or anything like that. And wow. Um, so you, you said you were going to read something to me. Was it just, was it another letter? <clears throat> I have so many letters, Nikki. Oh my goodness. <laughs> But we were talking about um, Violet Lindsay. It's kind yes. of funny that her name was Violet, right? From I love Wonderful that. Life. Oh, yeah. I love, and I love <laughs> that name in general too, but. Yeah. So um, she uh, has a letter here um, that she wrote to Violet dated March 11th, 1946. Um, I usually read the last part but since you're family, maybe I should read uh, the whole page. Yeah, please do. <laughs> yes. Uh, let's see. My family is well and wonderful. LaVon is here in California with me. Keith graduated from Iowa State wow. and is now an, um, an engineer with GE in Schenectady. Hmm. Billy Lee just finished high school in Denison, of course, and is waiting for Uncle Sam to make up his mind what to do with him. Did you know I have four a four-year-old sister named Karen Ann? She is adorable and such a joy to my parents whose children grew up and suddenly left them. And that's mm -hmm. the latest on the Mullingers. <clears throat> I just finished um, shooting Faithful in My Fashion with Tom Drake and will go into It's a Wonderful Life opposite James Stewart, his first since he's back from the wars, within a few weeks. This will be my big break, I think. And Tony and I are ever so happy. Uh, so far, we as husband and wife <clears throat> have run into no complications with two movie careers in one family. He is a wonderful guy. And it is a wonderful life with two exclamation marks. Wow. Love, Donna. Yeah. Wow. How beautiful is that? The, yeah. It's a beautiful letter. And um, to anyone who's, you know, wondering in that lineup that she said, Keith is my grandfather so he's my dad's dad and I always think it's funny on kind of a side note that's not really a side note um that Keith was an engineer because my husband Dan like my dad has told me so many times that there are very specific things about Dan that remind him of his dad so really? it's just funny like patterns that families yeah you know, have and get into. It's like, I, apparently I married someone in some ways very similar to his dad. I think not in others. Dan is very spunky, <laughs> but Dan is very much an engineer minded person. Like I said, kind of a side note, but just when you brought up Keith and that he went to school yeah. for engineering, it just makes me think of my husband. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uncle Keith was so sweet and mm. gentle. And I just remember him being um, really kind of like grandpa, like not um, very thoughtful, like whatever he, he, you talk to him about, he just never mixed words. He just was very mm. pointed and thoughtful and intelligent. He was really fun to talk to. What an interesting family coming out of Iowa. They all were, I know. Yeah. And then it's interesting that my mom is from Iowa as well. Like, that's just very that's interesting right. to me. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So my anyway, I think origins there. I yeah. like this um, letter because it shows that she's got a particular feeling about the movie before she goes into shooting it. That's yeah. what I was thinking. That's so wild. Yeah. I think this is going to be my big break. Like, you knew yeah. it, Donna. Yeah. <laughs> But of course, the movie did not do well. So, hmm. I mean, in a way, it was a break, but maybe not as exactly what you know she had envisioned because it didn't do so well at the time. Now she she lived long enough though to see it pick up traction, right? Because it really started picking up traction in like the seventies, if I'm right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah. Donna passed away in eighty six, correct? Correct. So we always had it on. Uh, at Christmas, well, not always, but in the 80s, it was definitely always on in the background during Christmas, you know, because like watching anything with her from the Donna Reed show was like, oh, you know, <laughs> because she's picking it to pieces. <laughs> yeah. But no, she was so happy. She was really, really happy about the fact that it was so popular. Yeah, that's so what how redeeming is that to think like, I think this is it and then have it not 
like really be what you imagined like oh it kind of flopped and then to see like oh redemption <laughs> it yeah. is it yeah. it did yeah. people got it yeah. they just more people needed to see it and you're totally right that idea of like VHS you know on demand DVD all of that not being a thing so it, it makes sense that like if it's not if it didn't all hit exactly at the perfect time the perfect way people able to you know being able to get out to the theaters that it wouldn't have it wouldn't have stuck so that's really that's amazing right because when you think about it like the audience the film didn't change it was the audience who changed yes. so uh -huh. I think it was too close to the end of the war when it was released I don't think people were wanted to see a movie about suicide and yes. you know kind of depression era values and that sort of thing and it is kind of a depression era film in a lot of ways so mm. yeah people people were kind of done with that but it's okay. It, it, I mean, just what an amazing trajectory this film has had. And it just, the other thing is it just continues to grow. I mean, every year, every year, and it's shown in more theaters. And wow, like I said, you know, the audiences in New York have been mostly in their twenties now. And, you know, it's, it's fantastic. Well, like you said, it's, it found um, a new audience, not only um, after the release, like shorter in the seventies, but even now it's continuing to find new audiences. And there was proof of that just when I went on YouTube and I searched Donna Reed and I couldn't believe, I mean, wonderful. It's a wonderful life as well, but even just Donna Reed, I couldn't believe how many people are still making videos talking about her and talking about the film and oh, really? reviewing the film it's like it's still very I expected honestly to see much older videos not super duper recent videos so it's just tells me okay people are still very much invested in the film and even in her as an actress and the work that she did that's that's great I did not know that and then that it's funny too because the one of the guys here who's the film programmer at the local independent film theater and he's kind of a bah humbug type of guy and he um you know he's at 35 and he said you know when i saw that end scene where they all the family comes together you know he's like this is not a movie for me right just too sentimental yeah but when he finally sat down and watched it there were so many other things that were so incredible that he loved and really respects and, you know, still loves about the movie. So. Wow. Well, okay. There's a couple more things I want to talk about before we wrap this up. Sure. One, one of the things was kind of, and I don't even know where this is going to go. I just think I, I mentioned this to you that it struck me as very interesting. And like I said, I don't know how deep we're going to go into this, but there's, you know, this culture's changed a lot since It's a Wonderful Life came out or since the Donna Reed show. And, you know, recent years have been wild. You know, that was part of our, our move from a larger city to a smaller town was everything that's unfolded in the last few years. And, um, you know, growing up when I was a kid, I went to a private Christian school. And I remember we had this thing that would circulate in the school, like news from around the world. And they would just like talk about different things that were happening. And they would talk about, I believe it was in, in Sweden or one of a Nordic country where they were legalizing um, assisted suicide euthanasia. Mm -hmm. And I remember we talked about it a lot in school is like, Hey, this is a, this is a really big deal that they're starting to make this more be more of a part of like the medical system <clears throat> and it's been really interesting because in the last few years you know it's it's become more accepted in other countries as well um one that's getting a lot of attention recently is canada because mm -hmm. they're from what i'm seeing and from what i can understand they're expanding the parameters um as to like what qualifies for someone to be able to have assisted suicide to to use euthanasia so to my understanding, the parameters were a lot tighter in the past. And now they're um, kind of expanding what falls under the category of like, okay, we will assist you in, in this process. And, um, you know, I mentioned to you that I had been looking up numbers in Canada specifically, and it, it turns out it really is on the rise. There are more people that are choosing um to end their life. And it's really interesting because I, I feel like in general, I saw a commentator talking about this, how there's been this cultural thing throughout history of like, you know, don't do it. Don't jump off the bridge. Like put the, put the thing, the net underneath, like catch them. We have to save them. 
And I feel like there's slightly a shift that's taking place. Like I said, that seems to me, even in looking at the numbers, like, oh, wow, this is, this is on the rise. And um, I think what It's a Wonderful Life does, and not only shows the contrast and and how the world has changed, but I mean, this is what we've talked about the whole time, right? It really shows how, you know, things can turn around, how a community can come together to support someone, um, Mm -hmm. how someone may not even know the integral role, intricate, integral, integral is the word, integral, right? Integral role that they play within their social network, within their community. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that that's why the film, like I said, speaks so deeply to a lot of people because that's a universal feeling, I think. Um, And it's just really interesting how the tides seem to be kind of changing in some ways. It's not something that's prevalent here in America. And I, I, I made an Instagram post on this recently. Um, I don't know if this even matters in the context of the conversation. I'm not even saying that I am hard stop a hundred percent against it. Like we all know that there are times like we're animals, you know, they're, they're dying, they're on their way out and um, there's an easier way for them to go. I lean more on the side of being against it. Part of it has to do with my faith. Part of it has to do with I can't help but think that it feels a little sinister that the numbers are increasing for a lot of different yeah. reasons, not only within the medical system, but just like says something about the state of the world to some degree as well. And I don't yeah. know why that is. I don't know if that has to do with this, like we were joking about this whole postmodernist view, this relativist. I don't, I don't know what it is, but the movie really speaks to that issue that I think is gaining traction and that is being talked about more. Um, and I don't even really know where I'm going with that, or if you have any thoughts back to that, but that's something that really struck me this year when I was thinking about talking with you. Yeah, that's interesting. I don't, um, I don't know anything about what you're talking about. So Mm. I do think it is incredibly interesting. Um, I mean, I remember back in the days of, you know, Dr. Kevorkian, I don't know if you remember him or have heard about him. The name rings a bell. So he, um, God, I wish I had, I think he was in the, maybe the eighties, but, uh, he, uh, kind of started this whole notion of assisted suicide. But by the way, you can let your mic hang. It'll still pick up fine. Oh, cause um, your vest is on. That's freezing in here. (laughs) I'm so sorry. No, no, there you go. Yeah. Just even holding it sideways. Like that's good. But if it's too close, it'll distort. I know it's probably not good that I'm I'm holding yeah. it like this. Um, yeah, it gets a little, it gets a little intense. <laughs> okay. So, so, um, yeah. Um, so Dr. So, Kevorkian started this idea, at least in pop culture. Yeah. And he, you know, he was in prison, in and out of prison all the time, but he started this conversation and also was helping people, but he was helping people who were terminally ill, mm. you know, and, um, and, and at that point, and I don't know if the medical profession is much better, quite honestly, yeah. um, it was, you know, doctors do everything to keep you alive, no matter what. Yeah, yeah. So um, for those reasons, I, you know, I would tend to be pro, you know, because uh, I I don't like suffering of any kind, especially. Oh, you mean, it's... you mean pro um, euthanasia? That's what you yeah, mean? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, we do it, you know, I mean, I, I don't want to sound crass, but you know, it's, it's great when you have an animal that's suffering or something like that, Mm -hmm. and you can end their life when you know, there's no hope. And I watched, um, you know, uh, my mother, you know, suffered terribly with the kind of cancer that she had, Mm -hmm. um, the pancreatic cancer that, that spread to her liver. And, and it was, it was awful. So I don't know, it's a mixed bag, but I also totally general suicide is on the rise. And I'm, you know, I'm not, that is disturbing because, you know, young people, you know, all this bullying that goes on on social media and in real life, that um, I am not a pro at all. And I, you know, the whole mental health situation in this country and um, that, that part is, is very upsetting. And that's a, that's a solution. I don't know what the solution is because it just seems to be getting worse, not better. Well, and that's the thing, right? Like I know we don't, nobody likes the phrase, the slippery slope, right? It's a little overused, but it is kind of scary to watch if what I'm seeing going on is actually going on, right? These numbers that I'm seeing are are on the rise and that people are being allowed 
to choose that because of of mental health issues and just other things that are starting to expand. Like I said, the parameters seem to be expanding. Um, there's something just sinister and, and sad yeah. seeming about that. Yes. Um, and it's yeah. just, just different, just different times. And, and even like, and, I, and we're going to circle back, I'm not going to go off on this too much, but you know, it's, like you were saying about medically assisted, you know, when someone is terminal or they're suffering, it's, it's wild how those, I keep using the word parameters, but have, have widened. So one thing that I said in the video was sometimes this will happen where babies who are not born yet will be diagnosed with things. And the mothers will be told like, your child's going to suffer like this. And I know people, so this isn't just like stuff I've heard in the news. This is like friends that I have. And then people like second and third connections, friends that are nurses that have actually watched this happen, um, where then the baby is born and they don't have the diagnosis that the doctor had, had said that the child would have. So it's a very interesting conversation. It's like, man, how flippant are we getting with the idea of turning off the lights? Like, well, this will be better. So let's do this. It's like, man, this seems like a very extreme situation that is possibly becoming more, more regularly utilized. And, um, I just think that's really sad, especially because I really do believe, um, that a lot of people know what it feels like to some degree or another to want to end things. And once again, to circle back, that's what I think is so powerful about the movie because I can't even think of another movie off the top of my head that really broaches this topic that the whole thing centers around the idea of someone yeah. who wants to commit suicide because right. they are so down and out about the situation that has unfolded in their life. And then through the course of the film comes to realize like, what, like, I, no, things can change. Like I can get out of this. Look at my community. Look at the role that I play in people's lives that I didn't even realize that I played in their lives. And I think that that's a needed message and that that's why the film continues to make such an impact in people's lives. Yeah. I think you're right about that too. Um, because also I don't, I mean, first of all, just getting back to the the medical thing. I mean, that's where statistics just really drive me crazy. You know, that because, you know, your baby is shown to have this, that, and the other, you know, the equation is this, well, no, no, you know, everyone's different. And I, yes. I don't, I don't really believe that. So that's, that's disturbing. It's super disturbing. I have an, yeah. a nurse friend that, that has watched abortions happen where then the child comes out and it was like, oh, turns out that that's not what the child have had. And, and then the mother is obviously just mortified. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to derail us, but it all no. kind of comes into the same. Yeah. Yeah. And it's very sad. And once again, I think what makes the film so, so uh, relevant still now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, it's really true that, that, um, that it, uh, what is great about it's a wonderful life really does not shy away from any of that yes. and, um, and the darkness and everything. And I just think, um, I just recently learned that Frank Capra actually struggled with depression in his life. Uh, which I did not know. Yeah, so that's not because surprising. He, yeah, right. But, but I mean, when you think about some of the earlier films mm. that are you know, so kind of upbeat and spirited, and mm. then his experience in the war and these other things that he would gravitate towards this movie is kind of incredible. And that is incredible. And, I, and um, yeah, I don't, I don't. Uh, it's a, it's just a very difficult situation we're in because I just heard on the radio the other day, um, this girl, her parents took her into the hospital because she was suffering from incredible depression and she wanted to end her life. And they kept her in the ER section for like three weeks because they didn't have a room, you know, for her particular, I mean, this should take priority over everything. Yeah, that's like a very interesting topic too. Just this idea of like, there's no longer really like mental health wards or what were they <sighs> called? The facilities I know that were taken out in the eighties. I don't remember what they were called. Just like whole facility. And I, yeah. I've heard why I get why they were 
eradicated, but it seems like, well, what do all these people do now? And, and mental health crises are on the rise, it seems. So what are people supposed to do? And then, and I think that it, unfortunately in this country, the tendency is to medicate. And yeah, yeah. I know from talking to people that they do not enjoy how they feel on this medication. Yeah. So, and that's not a solution. Maybe it's a band aid for a few days or something. Yes. Or, yes. I, I, it, I was on Lexapro for a period of time and it mm. was, it's a good way to word it like a band aid for a period of time. It was helpful when I needed it. But I'll tell you what, getting off of that was a nightmare. It was so oh difficult to get off of the medication, really? um, like physical withdrawals. And, mm. you know, it didn't, it didn't solve the core issues, but it did help for the period of time. And to be honest, the, the majority of the reason I was on it was for pain management. So that's kind mm. of a separate topic because apparently yes. I, I was told by the doctor when I was put on it, that the same part of the brain that like feels depression is the same part of the brain that deals with pain. Um, and, and she was right. There was a period of time where it really did help me, but it did not feel good after a long period of time and getting off of it was really hard. Um, yeah. so yeah, um, on another kind of the last thing I wanted to kind of touch with you, unless there's something else you think of, like while I'm talking is, uh, the Donna Reed foundation, because I don't, mm -hmm. I, my memory escapes me. I don't remember the details. You're going to have to tell me what the foundation yes. does, how it was started, all of that. Yeah, with pleasure. So um, as we had mentioned, when mom uh, passed away in, in 1986, she had bequeathed her Oscar to her hometown, to Denison, Iowa. That's cool. And uh, also unbeknownst to me, um, she had saved a lot from her both careers, film and television. Hmm. And so so we all went to, you know, she passed away in uh, January. And then in the summer, a bunch of us, including, uh, you know, the kid actors who were on the Donna Reed show and a lot of friends and family, we uh, met in Denison and we mm -hmm. memorialized the Oscar to uh, her hometown. And even though it was a sad reason to be there, we all had a really good time. There's just, there was something nice about Denison and the community. And mm -hmm. it was, it was really great to be there so mm -hmm. her husband at the time grover and some local journalists um kind of started thinking about maybe we should do more than just memorialize the oscar and they put together this idea of a donna reed foundation and it took a little while i think it took about a year to get rolling but we decided it would be an educational foundation mm -hmm. and that we would give away scholarships to kids going on to study in the performing arts, wow. especially, especially because, you know, mom, she, she just, you know, as fate would have it, she ended up in LA. She got her, uh, she won the beauty contest at Los Angeles city college. And that's what got the attention because her picture, her photograph was um, appeared in the LA times. Mm -hmm. So, she got all this attention from agents and such, and she put them off because she wanted to graduate in case the acting thing didn't work out, mm. but she didn't really have any preparation for becoming a movie star. Um, mm. So the idea of creating an educational foundation felt really right to, um, especially kids coming from the Midwest who, you know, it's the, the tendency is mostly musical theater. And, cool. you know, if they, decide to go to New York or LA, um, you know, there's a lot more to it than that, as you well know. Yeah. So we finally got the ball rolling and, uh, and my God, Grover ran the thing from his, uh, you know, just a computer in his office in LA, but it grew and grew and grew. And we, <clears throat> after about the second year, we had this um, festival, uh, the third week in June, and these really interesting people from the business came from uh, New York and LA. So mm -hmm. we had week long of classes. And then there was a gala performance, um, not necessarily the same kids who came to compete for um, scholarships in many categories. We had dance, we had musical theater, we had vocal, we had, um, you know, monologues. Uh, and it, it was just an incredible phenomenon. In fact, I was a judge for a few years. And then the kids wow. who came to compete were so good. I didn't, I didn't want to judge anymore because I, I couldn't. Oh. Yeah. 
It's yeah, we true have- art. It's hard to judge. It's, it's very relativist. <laughs> we need professionals. <laughs> oh. um, so we have a few kids who've gone on to make it on Broadway, actually. And wow. um, um, then after 9-11, you know, parents didn't want to send their kids. You know, there was like hmm. some downtime so we we're not doing the festival anymore but we have an, a strong online presence oh and in the meantime uh this area was bought, bought that housed an old german opera house so we refurbished it now it's the donna reed theater it just turned 100 back in 2019 wow how cool is that it's beautiful and if wow. you you know um and then there's the there's an archive in the basement and my mom's archive lived in many people's uh, garages and homes for a long time, but now it's in a temperature controlled environment. Very good. And it's in ex- excellent shape. It survived. Mm-hmm. Um, then we have the museum upstairs. And then there's an, there was an old candy kitchen that, that my mom used to go to. I remember it when I went to Denison. So we've huh. preserved most of that. And it's um, like a bake shop where you can get really good pastries and a lunch. Oh. And so it's like the Donna Reed Center now. Wow. And yeah. So it's incredible. And we're in the process of like restructuring it, but her Oscar is there. And if you go to DonnaReed.org, uh, the website's uh, really in good shape. And then, and then last year was her centennial. So if you click wow. on the celebrate section, you can see like a tribute video we made for her and the wow. governor, <clears throat> the governor proclaimed, her birthday, Donna Reed Day, which was incredible because, um, so grandma and grandpa also ahead of their time, <laughs> hmm. they um, they got pregnant with my mother before they were married. Oh, snap. Right. And so her birthday- Was Donna always... the oldest? Yes. Yes. Oh, that's right. I forgot. I just, sorry, this is coming back to me. I just yeah. relearned that this week, that yeah, we, are, sure we are both the oldest. Yeah. So I'm sure she was just mortified that I'm saying this, but, but because of that, her birthdays were always like this thing of shame, right? Because they came, oh. you know, less than nine months after they were married. Mm. So And then as a result, you know, all of us, my sister and I had these crazy birthdays, like, you know, zoo animals and pony rides. And oh my goodness, how funny is that? So the fact that her birthday has now been proclaimed Donna Reed Day in Iowa to me is like, I don't know. I'm so happy. Wow, that's so beautiful. Yeah. Uh, So anyway, the the foundation has a wonderful website and we're always happy to get new members and um, it's, it's really spiffy and you can, you know, find out a lot by cruising around. Very cool. That's very cool. So if someone, if a youngin is looking to get some kind of scholarship, do something in the performing arts, they can still look at the website and check it. It's still happening. We give, uh, we give uh, merit awards. Now you just submit videos because we don't, you know, we'll hopefully get back to having in person, but you know, COVID kind of shut everything down, changed everything. Yeah. So, um, it's, it's an online presence, you know, you can submit your reel, but that's so cool. Yeah. Thank you. Wow. Well, is there anything else you would like to touch on before we wrap this up? Um, gosh, I think we covered a lot. I, um, I don't know. Was there anything you can think of? It's hard because I could go in 12 different directions and like back up all the way to the beginning and talk more about your child. I mean, I could go every different direction. So it's always like rain it in Nikki. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, the thing with the childhood is, is complicated because I certainly Mm. don't want to appear ungrateful, you know, because in a lot of ways, you know, we were so incredibly well provided for, but I mean, having and even though my mother stayed so grounded mm. and never let her incredible success and financial success change who she was, yeah. um, it's just a very strange way to grow up. It just is. Totally. It it seems like a very strange way to grow up. Um, just having that many people know who you are and dealing with the studios and then producing content. I mean, it's really incredible to me that that they produced that show for yeah. so long together on their own. Yeah. Like that's, yeah. that's wild. Um, yeah. yeah. I can only imagine that it was a very unique upbringing. 
I mean, she also, she had like all these families, she had her birth family mm. and, you know, she helped, um, my aunt Karen got a schol partial scholarship to Stanford, but my mother paid for the rest of it. Wow. And, you know, she took really good care of grandma when she came down with Parkinson's and she was always finding out the state of the art, you know, medication and things. For oh, I forgot on. that she had Parkinson's. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Cause you know that obviously Keith did. Yeah. Yeah. That's very and, interesting. And, um, she, so she had her birth family, she had us kids, and then she had the show family. Hmm. And that's, you know, that's a very intense relationship too, because they were together yeah. like all day, hours and hours. It's, and yeah. I have, I have Christmas, I have lists of Christmas presents to all the crew. And mm. I mean, you know, yeah, she gave, she gave, she gave, she gave, she gave a lot to the world. Yeah, being on a set, people who don't work in the arts, I mean, I, maybe they could imagine this because maybe it's similar to being in an office. I don't know, like when you're with people all day, every day. I mean, I've had set families, you know, and theater families, but not for eight years, you know, it's like that's, and yeah. I felt very close to those people and very like, we created very unique memories and like the jokes are very specific and- uh -huh you know, you're overcoming very specific challenges together. And so I always think that about shows that run on television for a very long time, like, man, that is I actually just got chills. Like that's got to be next level. Um, I, I watched an interview with you, and someone else. And I think, I think he was the guy that played the son on the show. Yep. And he was saying that we were like, he's like, they were, they were my family. And I'm thinking, yeah, I could totally see that. Like eight years, day in, day out, creating, laughing, crying, having fun, doing things over and over and over together. I can see that being a legitimate, you know, extra family. Right. And also, you know, Paul and Shelly were only like 11 and 12 or something when they started the show. Yeah, so, so they literally, like they were adults. Yeah. yes, they literally spent their whole teenage years on that yeah. show. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, so, so my mother was almost like kind of simultaneously their boss and their, their mom, you know, a different kind of mom. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. What an experience. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, I don't even know. I guess that's pretty much it. <laughs> like I said, I feel like okay. I'm talking 12 different directions because. I, I really enjoy, I watch a lot of long form interviews. So I like the idea of like picking out the details and, and chatting through everything. And maybe some other time after we sit and think, maybe we'll have to have another chat and sure. there's anything else we want to talk about. If we want to go in deeper about things, even if people in the comments end up, people always leave very interesting comments. So people might say something that we're like, Ooh, that's very, yeah. interesting. like we should talk again. Okay. Um, so guys, if you, if there's anything you want to hear us chat about, if there's any questions that you have that I can pass on to Mary, feel free to let us know in the comments. Um, yeah, it always, on a side note, it's always weirded me out that she died one year before I was born. Like oh, I could have so close to, so close to meeting her. Mm. Um, how old was she when she passed away? Well, she was like a week shy of her 65th birthday. That's yeah. so young. Terrible. Yeah. That's so young. How old are you now, Mary? Well, I just turned 65 and I, I have to tell you, I just was really nervous. You know, I just thought, am I going to outlive my mother? I mean, I yeah. hope so. so. Yeah. Yeah. I hear that a lot from people who lose their parents on the younger side of life, that there's something very strange about passing the age that they lived to. And I've heard before, I don't know if this is true for you or I'm not even necessarily, I don't know. I like how I'm like ending it and then diving off the deep end. But okay. um, I've heard also people say there's almost like a, not like a survivor's guilt, but kind of like, wow, this is weird. They didn't, they didn't make it past this age. And yeah, just a nervousness around it yeah. in general. Yeah. Well, I think the hardest thing, and I hope you never experienced this because my dad died a couple of three years before my mother, which is interesting. I mean, he oh, was a lot older. Okay. So, um, but for me, I just felt 
my mortality like slammed up into my face and I just thought, well, I'm not going to live much longer. And that feeling lasted a long time, probably six, seven years. I just thought that's it. I'm, I'm next. And it's, and it's also like your parents are your thing. They're like, they have all the factual information on you and when you got your tonsils out and who you are and to have that gone, you know, I was still in my twenties when they both passed. So yeah, yeah. you were very young still. Yeah. But anyway, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry for your loss. And thank you. Mm -hmm. I can imagine that that would be really hard like you said, to lose that, um, there's almost like a, like a grounding to reality through your parents that when that goes away, I just could imagine that would be hard. That's very strange. Yeah. And I was, I was pretty sick for the first year. My mom died after she died. Yeah. I was just had stomach problems for Uh, for a year. And I know, you know, obviously it was related to that. yeah. Yeah. It's, um, Life is wild because it's so beautiful. I mean, as I'm looking out my window, I've got this like beautiful snowy mountain in front of me. It's, it's, life is so beautiful, um, but it's painful. And it's weird when you hit those just moments, everyone has different versions, right? Of those moments of pain in their life. Um, Not the same thing, obviously, but I, I miscarried earlier in the year. And miscarrying for me was one of those like slaps in the face where it was like, welcome to reality, baby girl. Like just realizing, oh yeah, like people die and things don't, don't go the way you want them to obviously, but, um, on kind of a separate note, that's not really separate. It was a trip because I, I don't know. I was so sick when I was pregnant And there's kind of this thought of like, oh, you just, just deal with the sickness. And then in the, in the end you get a baby. And it was a trip to be like, wow, I dealt with the sickness for two months and then my baby died and I didn't get the baby. I just was sick for nothing. And I don't really mean that because I tend to sit in the camp that like nothing is for nothing and all things work together for good. Hey baby, I'm almost done. Can you give me like a couple of minutes? Sorry. He can't hear you, but I'll tell him you said hi. Um, yeah, so I don't tend to believe that everything is that things are for nothing. I tend to believe that things work together for good, but it was really like a smack in the face of like, yep, this is reality. And some mm. people have kids and then their kids die. Like, so you miscarried, or some people lose their parents. Like, life is also, you know, loss. Um, but it's also so beautiful. And that's once again, sorry to be corny and tie it all in, but into the movie, like. It's a wonderful life and life is so beautiful simultaneously. And, and that's part of what makes life beautiful in a twisted way. Right. Yes. I agree. The darker shades, they make the brighter shades so bright. That's true. Yeah. Very beautifully put. Yeah. I'm so sorry about that, but, but Logan, I mean, this guy is, I know (laughs) he's so cute. He's a gift, man. I was very shocked when he showed up. I couldn't (laughs) believe it. And for me personally, Logan is a big part of what kind of doubled down my faith in a creator because it was the trippiest thing, Mary, to poop out a person, like to have, (laughs) to have a a person, like, you know, oh, people, where people come from. I know where people come from, but then you like pull this and they look at you and you're all of a sudden like, these are the same eyeballs that will be looking at me. Like if this kid lives to be 50, 60, like these are the same eyeballs and like you weren't even here and now you're here and now you have opinions and like, you make them known and things you don't want to do and things you do want to do. And it's just, it's such a um, gift. And he's added a really beautiful uh, color to my life. So thank you. Yeah. I, I love him so much. <laughs> yeah, no, I'd love to talk to you sometime about motherhood because, um, you know, it's such a mixed bag. And I think that my mm-hmm. mother even talked about that, that not, not all women should have kids. And yeah, it's a mixed you know, bag for sure. She wasn't all like, you know, rosy about it all the time. Yeah, Um, I definitely uh, went into it. And it's part of why I avoided it for a long time, thinking that it was just kind of like only focusing on the negative, for lack of a better phrase, like all hard, all 
So I was kind of, I think in a different camp than maybe a lot of women are in where maybe other women are like painting it as butterflies and whatever. And then they have kids and they're like, what? Like I was in the other camp, like, oh my gosh, too much. Can't do it. Like, can't do this. And then had a kid and was like, oh my God, nobody told me like how about the beautiful parts, like the parts that blow my mind because it's so sweet, you know? So I had like kind of the opposite experience. It's very difficult, (laughs) very difficult to raise a little person and to watch a person come online. Like it's crazy. We'll, we'll have to talk about that. Yeah. And like, why is, why are we not trained how to do this? I mean, all this emphasis on education, this is the most important job ever. And you don't, you just, you have a kid and you have to wing it. I know, you know, if I went off on that tangent, Mary, I'd become, I'd be an aggressive conspiracy theorist in this monologue. (laughs) So that's where things get a little nefarious for me. And I start getting on my, (laughs) but it's, I will just say like, it's a ride, you know, if we're using religious terms, it's sanctifying, like he is growing me and refining me and teaching me and showing me a lot about myself. And Um, He's also given me a lot of grace for my parents because I've now been put in situations where I'm like, dang, okay, that's, that's hard. So it's, I'm great. I'm grateful. I'm very grateful. So I'm, I'm very, I'm sad about the miscarriage. Um, But, you know, just like we were saying, like, that's, that's life, you know, life is complicated, many shades. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. On that note, I just, I really appreciate you having this conversation with me. And it really is like a a dream come true for lack of a less corny (laughs) sounding phrase. And I always knew we would get to do this or I hoped, and it's very surreal that it finally happened. And I'm grateful. I am too. Cause you know, I really, I like you a lot and uh, I just love how you are changing and evolving and think things out loud and you're vulnerable and I really appreciate that so I'm I'm really excited about this too. Thank you Mary. I appreciate <laughs> that you say that. I appreciate that you were willing to do this with me. Mm. I really like you. My family really likes you. <laughs> we're sending you e-hugs and Yeah. Yeah, well Merry Christmas and um yeah, I I need to come visit and you know, we don't want to stay in Iowa, so who knows, maybe we'll be yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't that be awesome? <laughs> I hope that you stay warm today and I hope that you yeah, don't you. lose your power. It's incredible that we were able to do this whole interview with like negative temperatures outside. Thanks yeah. technology. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to end now, guys. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. If you're listening to this on podcast, feel free to leave a review. I will leave links down below um, that I get from Mary to the website. Or if Mary wants her social shared, I'll leave everything in the info box. And um, that's pretty much it. I will, God willing, see you guys back here soon with another new video.